Welcome to Abolition Lessons here on the Schools Not Prisons podcast. Remember, there's no need to take an assigned seat. There will be no tests, no grades, and definitely no detention. All you need is an open mind. Founded in 2016, Schools Not Prisons is part of a larger movement to examine the history of the prison industrial complex and how oppression in all its forms has worked to criminalize young black and brown people across the United States. I'm your host, Irene Franco Rubio, and this is the Schools Not Prisons podcast. In this episode of the Schools Not Prisons podcast, we explore what embracing rest, wellness, and restoration as a form of resistance looks like. Ashley Monterosa shares her journey to movement as a young person and redefining what it means to fight for justice and to rest as a form of resistance to achieve true liberation. Um, yeah, we're so excited to have you here. I'm hella honored to be here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, just the vibe, you're really fitting the, the atmosphere. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, how you identify as, the work that you do, really just anything that you'd like to share with your group? Yeah, so I'm obviously Ashley Monterosa, pronouns are she, her, ella, sis. Um, I'm born and raised in San Francisco, have deep, 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 deep roots roots in my community back home um i come from salvadorian and argentinian immigrants um first gen and what really catapulted me into the work that was a question yeah 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 what catapulted me in the work well first off a lot of people who know me just like attach me to a specific experience Mm -hmm. um and like a catalyst moment in my life but even before that like I I recognize that I hold privilege coming from San Francisco, being radicalized by educators from like a really young age. I mean, I was already doing a lot of like movement building, organizing, advocacy, even though I didn't have the language for that until I was older um, back home, specifically when Mario Woods was shot and killed uh, by the San Francisco Police Department. I was a freshman in high school and I was going to a really small but hella dope charter school um I had really radical teachers that like they brought me or like they galvanized and mobilized students to go to like a a vigil for Mario Woods and from then on I was just kind of catapulted and and brought into a different space um and then more recently um my brother Sean Monterosa was shot and killed by officer Jarrett Tan of the Vallejo Police Department and then instantly so my brother was killed on June 2nd my 20th birthday was on June 3rd yeah so also attaching um, a really traumatic experience to like a celebration the next day was such a blur into this day is something that I'm like learning to navigate through. Um, but my brother's death and, and dying at the hands of the state really catapulted me to a space of policy advocacy. Yeah. So some people attach me to a specific experience and that experience being that my brother Sean Monterosa was shot and killed um, by the Vallejo Police Department during the George Floyd uprisings. So my brother was out in a Walgreens parking lot um, where his last text message actually was to my sister and I asking us to sign a petition to get George Floyd justice. And that was 30 minutes later, my brother was shot and killed by an officer that was basically pulling up to the parking lot in an unmarked pickup truck. The officer, trigger warning um, also, the officer was in the backseat of the pickup truck and grabbed his AR-15 and shot through the windshield Mm -hmm. of the truck, um, killing my brother while my brother was on his knees with his hands up surrendering. Um, And so immediately organizing, having to, well, again, my birthday was, my brother was killed on June 2nd. My birthday was on June 3rd. And immediately I'm having, where my sister and I and our family are having to navigate Um, What even happened? Um, The police department never reached out to us to let us know what happened. Um, We're instantly having to become our own detectives, plan a funeral, um, start an Instagram account to get justice for our brother, whatever that even looked like at that time. Right. Um, And also trying to grieve and process as like this train is starting to to go at a thousand miles per hour. So it's just a lot to hold on to. And here we are almost four years later. Um, there's been a lot of growth in my own language and how I even talk about like abolition even. Like even that's an evolving um, thing of mine. How I show up to spaces is very different to how I would show up um, during the early days of when my brother was first killed. So that's like quick background info. Yeah. My experience and what brings me to the space. No, thank you, Ashley, for sharing. Well, one, I'm sorry for the loss. And I think it's something that... One, it's like 
that is precisely why not only are you tied to one experience, but how that experience moved you in all the different ways. And I think one thing I wanted to touch on, too, is like you mentioned your sort of consciousness emerged long before that had happened. Right. And I think there's a lot to say there about how you feel about the world and how you show up in the world and that you're not tied to one experience. So I just want to center that. Um, but altogether, I think you being a young person and being in conversations on abolition and being directly system impacted in that way, there's a lot to really ground ourselves with with that. So I just wanted to like give you the space to know that like I fully acknowledge and see you as a whole person as well. So, Thank you. oh my goodness, I just, um, yeah, I think it's a beautiful thing that you're constantly pushing yourself to move forward and, and learning and understanding what these things can mean. Um, so just thank you all together for, for sharing and for being here. Um, I wanted to go back a little bit on, you mentioned a bit about your educators and how that really was the foundation for what it meant to be a young person learning about these ideas long before you're being directly impacted by it. How did that start to take place for you, knowing that well, I guess at this point, not knowing what would later happen, but knowing that you as a young person cared about these things. How did your educators really kind of play a role in your understanding of what was happening despite not having the language to to explain it? Yeah, so I remember, so again, I went to a really like radical small charter school. There was like 300 of us. Um, and even walking in here, actually, a bunch of these books were given to us as wow. students, like Franz Fanon, like Re um, the Wretched of the Earth. That's, you were reading that? It's yeah, we were reading that. I was, I was, I was a freshman, like That's learning. Amazing. It was a lot of you know academic academic words yeah. and having to figure out even the language. Um, but yeah, I was all of most of these books, not all of them, but um, it's fun. well. One, I'll say that most of these ideas I didn't encounter until college. Wow, so I think there's. That's that's amazing, first and foremost. But it's also <laughs> like we should all be able to understand these things at a young age, despite not having like the actual definitions of what these things mean, but starting to like understand there's a broader system and way of thinking happening. Mm -hmm. So how did you start to think about it? Like, even though it may have been challenging. At I remember being in like my social studies class and my teacher was like, this is this re this week's reading. Read it. And the first reading literally during the first week of school was. Um, the history of policing mm. and how the history of policing was actually slave captures. Yeah. Um, and even that like was just mind blowing for me. It was just something I never knew. Right. Like, being brought up um, in my community, you know, you're used to like your Latino elders saying if, you know, if you're not behaving, I'm going to call the police on you, yeah. you know. And so then diving into like the, the, the history and the origins of policing and over policing and surveillance and things um, definitely started to radicalize me and, and made me pay attention to more of what was going on in my community. OK, so you mentioned that as a kid and growing up Latino, like there's this common sort of understanding that if you're misbehaving we're gonna call the cops on you which is like obviously kind of inherently traumatic mm -hmm. at a time but it's also it was funny at the time too because we were being pushed to feel afraid of a larger system uh, how did that make you feel as a kid and maybe now as you've come to understand it definitely fear-mongered when I was young I'm like oh immediately it was like oh you have to act right otherwise this other entity is going to get called into your house yeah and and start correcting you um so I definitely wouldn't I would stop whatever I was doing and then start acting right, right, or well-behaved, whatever that looks like. Um, and I think a lot of the times our parents come, as being a first-gen Latina coming or, like, being raised in my city, I think a lot of times our, our parents come from other countries where they're, where they're they're fleeing persecution, they're fleeing a lot of things. And so they come with this whole thing of, like, the American dream and like the American dream sometimes for some Latino families is you either join the police force or you go into the army or the Navy. And like also we need to like not normalize that. Yeah. But that's yeah. like for another conversation. Um, so I think a lot of times like the cultural things is attached to like what public safety looks like in Latino communities is like policing and over policing because we attach that to feeling safe mm, and how did you find that your family or people around you like started to internalize those ideas like whether it was um just in your upbringing or maybe after the experience occurred like how did the relationship with the police or understanding of public safety start to evolve if, if at all yeah I mean for me um there was a lot of um you know police violence in San Francisco so 
from a young age when I was a teenager, I was like, okay, also FTP, all these things, all these ideologies mm-hmm. I was like exposed to. Um, so I definitely started to challenge those ideas with like the elders in my home and in my in my neighborhood even. Um, and even to this day, right? And also to the point where when my brother was first killed, it was kind of like, you know, we were emerged and catapulted to like organize and march and do all these things. And a lot of the elders in, in our family were like, why are you doing that? You don't need to do that. Like, that's the lawyer's job. And it's like, sure, civil lawsuit, that's cool. But like advocacy, you need to apply pressure. You need to like mobilize communities and and things like that. There's always this like also new generation thinking and, and ideologies that are constantly challenging, um, you know, the elders in our communities also that – they also have to undo a lot of work. And as I'm learning a lot of things, I'm also challenging myself to unlearn a lot of those mm-hmm. things. And subconsciously, I'll show up in a certain type of way or I'll think a certain thing. And I'm like, that's not right. Um, you know, and so, you know, just the cultural things of, of you know, Latinos and policing very much. Yeah. Yeah. It's just the whole thing. No, yeah. <laughs> and I think one thing that I found interesting in our conversation before this that you shared was about how not only – were you kind of emerging into consciousness already that your brother as well too was like a sort of youth member in the org that you now work at which I was like that's so beautiful how like the the world really comes to show you that like one everything's kind of interconnected and we're all being pushed towards liberation in different ways Um, but would you want to share a little bit about how these ideas of policing showed up in your family or in your community in one way or another influenced you and your your siblings Um, how does that kind of show up in the work that you do now at the org that you're that you're at? Yeah. So I think, you know, heavy in our home was like, we don't call the cops, period. Like, even though you would hear the or the elders, our, our mom even, or our tia say, where am I la policia if you don't act right? Um, we would always be like, you know, it's law. Like, you don't call the cops ever because if... And also it started to make us see a different way of we keep us safe. Mm-hmm. Um, so my brother was working at a local community-based organization in San Francisco called Horizons. Mm -hmm. And it was the program that he was participating in was called LifeWorks. So it's basically um, a program for system-involved, justice-involved youth that are actively going through the probation system, um, that are going under case management, um, and and a bunch of programs with that. And so my brother loved the program, got workforce development even, Mm -hmm. and then eventually stepped up in leadership and elevated himself to a coordinator in training um, as a teenager. And so I think from that, um, really just, and during that time, he was reading a lot of the autobiography of Malcolm X, and Mm -hmm. that was his favorite book. Um, And even just saying that right now, like, or earlier when I first walked in, brought me like a little, a little like love tap because I was my, that was my brother's book for like through and through. Yeah. And so now, you know, my brother was mentoring other at-risk youth or youth in the community and even, you know, just youth that were also going through it. You know, a lot of a lot of times young people just need space yeah. um, and someone that's just going to, like, show up for them and, and listen to them. Um, and I think my brother was that for a lot of a lot of young people w- while he was at Horizons. And so fast forward. um, a year ago, I applied to a position there for a program coordinator. Um, I never, if you asked me or told me that I was going to work at um, the organization my brother was at years ago, I would have laughed. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's crazy how creator works, how things come back full circle. And now I'm actually serving young people, um, teaching social justice issues, leadership development, life skills, um, and substance prevention. Yeah. So I'm in the schools oh. all the time <laughs> working with young people. And it's, it's legacy work also of my brother, but also it's hard work for me. Yeah. Um, a lot of times people just do things because it's just a job. And for me, it's, this is my life, you know, and I don't play about my life. Um, so, yeah. No, I love that. That's so beautiful. And it's just a beautiful, like, way to understand. Again, it's a full circle moment and, like, bringing you closer to what matters to you, not only because you've been impacted by it, but because we should all care. Mm-hmm. And I think, too, with the young people you're working with, they're often kind of defined as being at risk, right? But in a lot of ways, they're very much so like the rest of us, and need the space to be heard or to learn and grow in the ways that they um, are trying to understand current systems in their life. And I'm wondering what sort of like concerns or like issue areas are of interest to them. Like what um, have you come to learn after working with them that they really seem driven by? I, you know, recently, more recently, a lot of young people are trying to 
at least at, at Horizons, that the youth that I serve are talking about how there's a lot of gentrification going on in the communities. You know, um, communities of you know black, black and brown communities are being over policed, mm-hmm. but and they're not doing anything. There's nothing going on in the community, but you know, a lot of the times we're seeing our young people just get picked up for for wearing a certain color mm-hmm. or just looking some type of way or acting suspicious or whatever. And so we're seeing a lot of our young people fall into the system. Um, and so there's a lot of conversations where young people are just asking questions of like, mm-hmm. what can I do? Like, how can I make an impact? Um, and so just pouring into young people is really important. And I think in certain spaces, there's a lot of gatekeeping. Right. And so for me, in my position working at the CBO, I'm like, I don't want to be in this position forever. Like, I want to train the youth that are system involved in going through the system to then take my job, to then pay it forward and yeah. pass the baton to them, to then they pour into um, the other young person and, and share all of that wisdom. And so it's just a thing of, you know, reciprocating and, and paying it forward. And yeah, so there, I've come to see that in like in the in the movement space or just like in the nonprofit industrial complex, even there's a lot of gatekeeping. And by that, what I mean is that there's a lot of folks in, in leadership that will stay there. Someone will be, for example, someone will be like an executive director for 30 years. That's awesome that you have deep ties to your community doing that work. But who are you actively training that's a young person to then take your job? Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think even with that, um, someone who can be in like no shade to the to the to the ED that's been there for 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 30 years. But you're not keeping up with what's going on on the ground Mm -hmm. and you're not having that connection with the young people. You're not understanding what's what's trending. Mm -hmm. What are the common factors that are going on in the neighborhood? And so I think it's important to to one train also you not you're not just you're, you're not going to tokenize the next person and just give them the job you have to actively pour into that person with leadership development professional development mm-hmm. um mentorship yeah. even so yeah no i love that you say that because i feel like coming up in the movement in arizona um and later now in la but in arizona in particular i felt those exact same sentiments and i will say and i guess kind of share to give context here so i grew up and we kind of talked about this during the era of sb 1070 which is just part of my sort of story Um, and understanding what anti-immigrant rhetoric was and how policing in that way took place, whether like immigration and um, how like abolition intersect. Uh, But I think I started to find that, yeah, like these movements are being run by the same 10 people (laughs) for like forever. And there's sort of a behavior that's like, not necessarily wanting to give young people the space to kind of take over or to have have some room but not really say too much. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel like I started to encounter that and it made me realize the sort of anti-blackness, anti-this, anti-that that started to occur in like different ways. Yeah. Um, basically kind of preserving the ideas of like this is the movement that we came up in and that we were taught and that we understand and we're going to keep it that way, which I'm like – kind of blew my mind that that happens in movement spaces too. So it's good to hear that you're like seeing these same sort of behaviors or tendencies that Mm -hmm. like are inherently, I think, detrimental to a movement. Like how are Mm -hmm. we supposed to move forward after that? Um, But anyway, I say all that because I find that we don't really like give the space to understand that young people are perhaps the most critical element of what it means to build a movement, right? Like that's the point is a movement, like it has to move on. Um, but anyway, going a little bit back to what you were saying about how young people are being sort of impacted, whether by like the policing outside of school, but also I imagine in schools, Mm -hmm. how have you understood the school to prison pipeline in sort of your region or with the young people that you work with? Yeah, honestly, truancy, no one really talks about Uh, it, Yeah, but it's like, if you're truant in a lot of the times, young people are just, will be tardy. And eventually so many tardies can classify as truancy even. Um, But I've come to realize a lot, like the common denominator is just mental health. Mm. A lot of times young people just aren't feeling it or will say verbatim, I'm not feeling it. But what that really means is you're not feeling well. You don't have the the capacity to show up in the way that others want you to show up to school. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to go. And so I think a lot of the times I was even classified as truant for a period when I was in high school high achieving academic but I just hated going to school Mm -hmm. like I hated the the, the structure of school like just the system itself Um, I wasn't fond of it and so you see a lot of times young people get sent that letter in the mail saying you're truant Mm -hmm. like if you got to show up to court with your parent and if you don't show up to court like you know 
and that'll be like an intro, a, a soft introduction to like the school to prison pipeline. Yeah. Um, obviously, you know, in San Francisco, we don't really have like metal detectors that you have to go through um, to to get into school. But what there is is like there's a lot of school resource officers or school officers and there's been incidents not in san francisco but i know here in la county that there was maybe two years ago there was a young girl who came to pick up her brother and was there was there was a there was an altercation between the girl and uh, some other girl at the school Mm -hmm. and she pulled up to defend her brother Mm -hmm. and the school resource officer shot and had killed her and i really don't i don't remember her name and i I feel really bad not knowing her name, but I remember like just hearing that story made a really big impact. Like you just come, you're just coming as a big sister to show up for your brother yeah. and defend him. Like raise your hand if you would have defended your brother from like right. arguing with some girl or whatever. Um, and then being met with like violence. Mm. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so a lot of the times we don't think about how like school security or school resource officers can also over police schools, but then also lead to police violence. And we sometimes are too busy with other things that we don't really connect those together and mm-hmm. how they're 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 linked. Yeah. No, and I love that as a idea of saying and you had said this before that like gun violence is police violence or police violence is gun violence and how those things are very interconnected and they both persist um regardless of in this case it's lawful, right? Like if a police officer does it it's considered like okay and the law will do whatever it takes to protect that officer for defending or whatever the reason is um however young people in that case are always considered to be like criminal for Mm -hmm. doing something that is inherently not wrong um but how did you kind of start to understand these things whether it sounds like different cases started to happen or you would hear about it um whether it was happening on on school campuses or just like in your life around you like what did this make you think about um sort of getting to a place of understanding Uh. abolition like hearing those ideas first and then abolition kind of emerging as an afterthought. Yeah, I think when when I first heard the term and I was in high school, I heard the term abolition. I was like, oh, I, and you know, instantly when you're not giving like any if you don't have any like language or you don't have anyone supporting you like with the like toying with that, mm-hmm. um, you're probably going to be like super defensive and be like, oh, that's not possible, whatever. Um, and I think for me, I didn't have that reaction. If anything, it really fascinated me and made, made me want to read more mm-hmm. and learn more about it because I was already seeing that the systems and the powers that be one, they're not broken because they're doing what they're what they're designed to do. But also, I'm like, it, this shit ain't even working. So what's it like? Let's go, let's see what we can collectively imagine um, and work towards collective liberation. And so for me, um, thinking about prison abolition, like even reading the teachings of Miriam Kaba, how we do this till we free us and we keep us safe, mm-hmm. um, is really fundamentally important to like even just share that knowledge with people in your community who might not you know, really be accepting of the, of abolition, just having conversations and, and trying to hear other people's perspective. And a lot of times I I don't agree with other people who are abolitionists because they'll, you know, they're like, you can use violence for more violence to then get peace or achieve a common goal. But it's like, even though I don't agree with certain theories or ideas, I still welcome that. Mm -hmm. Um, Just because, you know, yeah, I just welcome I just welcome different ideas of abolition and for me, you know, obviously seeing how police departments definitely are are overpaid for sure. Yeah. Um we're seeing how um people that are doing violence interrupt uh, uh, violence interruption work, um gun li- gun violence prevention work are doing amazing work but are often underfunded. I guess I'll ask you um, knowing that there's a, sort of different understandings of what abolition can mean and ways to approach it. Did you start to have pushback or experiences and conversations with with folks who uh, maybe didn't welcome the idea as much as you did and like were hesitant to accept such like a liberated way of thinking? Yeah, I think when you pose that to young people, especially like I'm actively do like teaching these things to my students and they're like, well, what if someone does this to some harm someone in this way? Mm -hmm. They should be punished for sure. And I'm like, damn, I agree with you. But also, if I'm saying that, I'm also not fully being an abolitionist even, right? Um, So also trying to figure out ways of restorative justice where there can be reconciliation also. But yeah, so, you know, introducing the concept of abolition and 
the idea of abolition, a lot of young people face you with like, oh, well, if someone harms me, then I'm a, you know, an eye for an eye type of energy. Like if someone does that to me, I'm gonna do that to them. And, and ten, 10 times worse, it's like, okay, that's cool. But what if it looked like what, but think about it this way, right? Mm-hmm. And just giving different alternatives and, and, and just mentorships to get them to the point to start thinking like, okay, beyond what they already know mm-hmm. um, is really important. And I think a lot of times, Young people aren't given spaces where they're, they they can challenge their own ideas, but also feel safe enough or have permission to to just dream beyond the norm, mm-hmm. dream beyond what's already going on, dream beyond the block even, you know? Yeah. And so I think it's really important, especially with black and brown young people, we're constantly being harmed by these systems whether it's through you know over policing so right like over surveillance and stuff but even down to like housing inequity like Mm. food insecurity like all those things our young people are actively going through it and for sure the the pandemic like exacerbated all the things but young people like post pandemic are still going through and and are playing catch up Mm. in so many ways catch up in like with their schoolwork catch up with like what's just going on in the world period Mm -hmm. um and i think a lot of the a lot of young people like from 2020 to now were like ignited like they had a fire in them but like all these things that are going on um just ignited like a a hunger and i don't know if the the word is hunger but just ignited something for them to feel anchored in the movement space Mm -hmm. and i i think too the point that you referenced earlier about young people and this idea of truancy and not feeling it about going to school and like and very rightfully so oftentimes because the world in which they're living in the conditions in which they have um being you know low income or experiencing housing insecurity or just like the larger issues of the world and how pandemics and things influence lives it sounds like too this idea of them and their mental health as just young people overall or just as human beings is not being fostered or nurtured or ever really considered in school, traditional school spaces. So I imagine when they come and organize with you, it's giving them the opportunity to think freely and to feel liberated in the ways that like literally no one else is doing. And I think last point I'll run I'll reference from what you said earlier is the over-policing that happens in schools too. I think there's so much to be said there about School is not a safe place for many young people or many don't feel safe because they can have an altercation with an officer or they can feel like if I say something too crazy or if I make it seem this kind of way, I'm going to get in trouble. Um, Do you encounter that your students or just young people that you work with are feeling these sentiments and and don't really invite these these ideas of learning um, as opportunities to grow because they're being kind of restricted to do so? Definitely. And I think one... And it goes back to what I said earlier is young people just need space, right? If you give space and permission combined, because, well, I don't have to give youth permission to do anything first off. But what I mean is like just giving young people space to give themselves permission, because a lot of the times we treat youth specifically, we, we, we want to treat them like adults, but then rep reprimand them like they're children. Mm -hmm. So it's like, how are we showing up for young people? it authentically if you want to treat them like a child but then want them to make decisions like an adult Mm. um and a lot of the times are you know black and brown young people especially black and brown women are always being adultified so Mm. even even with that and like the concept of like young people right now and i'm starting to like steer away but i'll bring it back like how young people in social media are seeing like you need to you need to have like a car, you need to have a house, you need to have like a big bag, like get a bunch of money by this age. And if you're not, then you're not you're not doing it right. Right. Mm-hmm. One, that's capitalism. That's white supremacy. Yeah. Let's name it. Um, and a lot of the times we ourselves become agents of white supremacy because we're that's what we're, we're constantly being fed. Right. And so. Again, giving permission to have conversations like these are really important mm-hmm. to just give more knowledge and wisdom and just. Creating spaces like this hold power, but it encourages people to be vulnerable and share their experiences with what they're going through. Um, But back to like black and brown young women, they're always being adultified. And then, you know, there's like this a lot of people glamorize like getting things fast. Mm. And a lot of the times it'll sound cool. We're listening to music like I love Lil Baby. I love all these artists that are, are that are, you know, painting this this life. 
and our young people will listen to it and we'll we'll then like be like all right bet if they're doing that that's what i want to do and then again we'll we'll push themselves into the system without really thinking about things mm. and so I think it's important for young people to have like someone in their life, like a mentor, whoever, or just even if it's like the homie down the block, Mm -hmm. you know, like someone that can pour into them and give them some type of knowledge, Mm -hmm. but also just be real with what's going on in the world and and give them space to challenge their ideas and dream beyond the block was what I was saying. Right. And I think, too, this example that you referenced on like social media and ways of thinking and like we want things how they are and like we want this sort of glamorous life or whatever it may be, really, I feel like what you're hinting at, yes, is white supremacy. And it's really like how colonialism persists in all of our lives and all of our ways of thinking and schooling as one way that should be a sort of resource and way to learn. But we go anywhere else to go learn what it is that we think we want to know because we're not learning it at school or we're not being like given the sort of community spaces to, to have those critical conversations Mm -hmm. Um, and so I wonder like for you how did you make that distinction like all right this is not whatever social media is telling me is not the life that I want I'm seeing how real issues are impacting my life and people around me like how did you really start to push things in a way that was like the the so-called world that and reality that we're living in is not a way to to live life like I want to be part of movement I want to understand that I could take action how did that start to take place for you I think for me one, obviously, was my brother being killed at the hands of the state. Um, and then my experience is so unique and not everyone has this experience that it's so complex that, like, I have my own journey within this space and in the movement space because, one, I'm 23, but also people my age aren't doing what I'm doing. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I'm like, I can't connect to people that are my age that are, are having are doing all these youth activities and I'm forcing or I'm being pushed to, like, adultify myself even more or, like, hang out with folks that are like 30 and up and doing the work that I'm doing. And so even just being a young person in the space is a challenge. But back to what you were saying is like, damn, I lost my train. No, you're good. And I think exactly what you're touching on, like being a young person in movement is like super hard. Like, I think we totally undermine it as like, oh, we're just like, we care about these things because we should care about them. But I feel like, you know, and I had talked to you about this before, like we're the same age and I was like, Ashley seems great because I feel like (laughs) she totally understands like my own concerns too, you know? And it's like, we need to start to understand things as like, how can movements be inviting to young people? Because it seems like it's me, you, and 10 other people. But like making it an open (laughs) space, making it an open space so that people can like, feel invited like I can be part of that I can be a leader in my own right and I think the hesitancies that we encounter is kind of what you shared earlier where in movements people who preserve leadership keep it um in in sort of traditional schooling spaces we're not being fostered to even try to achieve leadership so how do we like get to a place of encouraging young people to think that way like what would you say to a young person now who's like wants to understand and engage in ideas of abolition but like hesitant to do so because of their sort of misconceptions about it or anything like that honestly just and it sounds hella corny but like honestly read (laughs) read and ask questions um i think a lot of the times we're nervous or young people are just nervous to ask questions because you're afraid you're gonna sound stupid or whatever but honestly there's power in asking questions that means you're you have a deep craving for like knowledge um and and all those things right um yeah yeah and I think one thing that you touched on as well in our conversations was how our lives are impacted by different systems or different issue areas or different um whether it be immigration or criminal justice or criminal injustice in this case um or environmental justice or gender justice like all these things seem like siloed issues seem like individual isolated ideas but you've kind of understood that all these things are very much so interconnected and I kind of broadly define that as like intersectional movement building um how do you embody that and how is that something that you like center in the work that you do yeah so obviously what catapulted me into the space was my experience with my brother being killed at the hands of the state so police violence um, which then, you know, I was on this hamster wheel in this train that was going a thousand miles per hour. I wasn't even taking care of myself. Um, and I was just, I like, I was lying to myself that I was like, oh, I love the grind. I'm, I'm, I'm booked and busy. That's cool, but I'm tired. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <It's> right. <laughs> right. Um, 
very much like booked and busy doing this work. Yeah. Like I was just trying to like feed it to myself that to validate that all the hard work and all the sacrifices I was doing was worth it. Mm. But I was still tired. Mm. And so I think a lot of that is very much like it also brought me to the space of mental health. Mm. And, I, you know, it's not really a thing that we talk about in our culture um, as Latinos. Oh, you, you're, you're depressed. That's not a thing. Mm. Or, you know, we don't hold space for those conversations. Mm. And so even though the mental health space and behavioral health is very, like, white, um, I'm, I'm very grateful. And I also need to step away from, like, oh, my God, I'm so grateful because I have a right to be in these spaces. Mm-hmm. Um, as someone with the, with the lived experience to be in the mental health spaces for advocacy, policy reform, um, a lot of the times we talk about mental health, but we're not – in the broader subjects around mental health, when people talk about mental health, they are talking about suicides and cyberbullying. Mm. Yeah, those are valid, but I feel like our young people are struggling and going through the foster care system. They're being over-policed in their neighborhoods. A lot of young people um, are just going through a bunch of other things that we don't classify or connect to mental health. Right. Yeah. Um, we just think of it as like, oh, I'm just surviving. Mm-hmm. And I remember asking a young person last year for his graduation. I was like, what do you want for your graduation gift? And he was like, I just want to live. Mm-hmm. And I really sat with that and I was like, damn, that's crazy. I was like, one, our our, our youth are, are are taking each other out. They're 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 fighting in the streets. But also we're not in a we're not in a safe community. We don't that's not even let me backtrack. No, we're not in the climate in our city at least isn't safe enough where everyone's beefing. Like police are already over policing. Like young people just wanna like live. Mm-hmm. But they're being they're also caught in this hamster wheel of just trying to survive. Um and so which also leads them to not create or have enough time to dream beyond what's already going on, mm-hmm. to think about things like abolition, to think about all these other things. Cause you know, they're like, man. If, honestly you tell a high schooler like oh let's let's talk about abolition man they'll be like man fuck that shit let's talk about this beef that's going on whoop 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 right um because they're so focused on what's going on and so creating spaces for young people to just yeah have these conversations are yeah. important no and i think what you touched on in the beginning is like mental health is the like through line through all of this like mm-hmm. whether it is having encounters with other youth and like feeling some type of way and then having encounters with the police and feeling a total other way and like all together it's like you're never fully at peace you're never fully able to just live as you as you said mm-hmm. and i think that is like that in itself if you're not able to just live and not constantly like fighting to survive then are you really resting right mm-hmm. and so i think that's bringing us to like the theme of today's episode which was uh, rest is revolutionary and like rest as an idea is what it means to be an abolitionist too and i think like you've really learned to embody mental health as like a way of like moving forward how it's like very much so tied to the work that you're doing and it's not isolated it's not separated but one cannot exist without the other like liberation will not happen if we don't rest and Mm -hmm. liberation will happen if we don't think about mental health and all the different forms that you mentioned that it occurs so how do you start to practice that how did that you allow yourself give yourself the space to think like yes I'm in movement but I'm tired and I like need some space and I want to also rest just like how anybody would want to how did you start to approach that I think unfortunately I had to experience burnout To then take a step back and pivot and be like, oh, damn, this is not it. This is not healthy. Um, To then explore and even exploring what rest looked like. For me, rest is saying no even. Like saying no is some people might might not think that's rest, but like setting boundaries with folks um, is rest. Like you're choosing yourself. Um, And a lot of times where for me, I'm always worried about the next person. I want to fix the the next person's problems to deflect my own issues. Yeah. Um, and so for me, it's really just putting the mirror in front of myself and, and pouring into me. Mm-hmm. Um, oftentimes I'm giving so much energy to what's going on in the world that I'm not even feeding myself or watering myself. And so I think it took a really hard experience of burnout that like then I became super depressed mm-hmm. and didn't want to do the work anymore. Like the work that I like not only was catapulted into that I love doing was starting to, I started to have resentment Mm. towards. Mm -hmm. And I think when we don't rest, you start to have resentment for X, Y, and Z or whatever it is that you're, you're, you're doing. And so it started with just saying no to things. No, I'm not available for this. 
And before that, I, I was saying yes to every opportunity because the grind. Mm. Like you wanna get a salir en adelante. You're like the first gen. You know, you wanna you wanna make it. You wanna make a way. You wanna make it out. Um, but you can do all of that, but also take care of yourself. And so I had to like navigate it and create a different pathway for myself where I was like, let me stop saying yes, start setting boundaries. No, I'm not available after 5 30. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you can't don't call me before this time and no, I don't want to do things on certain dates, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and even that was so hard because I felt like I was turning down a lot of things. And you know what? What's meant for you won't go past you yeah and that's how I also move like it's okay to say no to things but what's meant for you will not go past you um and so actively I started meditating and that was very new to me Mm. or just mindfulness like just sitting in silence I love sitting in silence now I used to be and I'm still sometimes can thrive in chaos and I used to love thriving in chaos like like you know being multifaceted and and multitasking that's cool and everything but I don't if I have to choose to multitask or just rest or slow down and sit in silence I'm gonna sit in silence and just chill and do one thing at a time um because otherwise I'm constantly overwhelmed and anxious and I I briefly told you on the drive here that I was feeling overwhelmed yesterday um just with my day job and writing a grant for that was due today at noon and then coming here like it was just a lot um and so learning how to organize and time manage is really important. Yeah. And I think what's happening for in your particular case and mine and many young people is like you're being thrown into a world where you feel like and oftentimes not just feel but kind of have to become all these things, right? You're like taking care of yourself, needing to survive, making a living, trying to still pursue the things that you want to pursue um, and amid all of it being in movement at the same time, which in itself is taking a toll, it's, right? It's demanding it's, too. <laughs> and it feels overwhelming, right? You were sharing mm-hmm. with me like just how, you know, in this case, like you felt like you wanted to cry because it feels like a lot. And I can totally resonate with that because there's no, in this era, there's no way to kind of just like take everything that is and not feel anything about it, you know, uh, but instead trying to use it to like move forward. And, and you referenced that your sister is someone that uh, is there for you and is constantly, I she's older than you, if, mm-hmm. I, if I recall. Um, is guiding you in that way as well yeah and I will also just add that like a lot of the time we're constantly like just grinding right and it's really hard to just stop because if we stop especially in movement space if you well and this is what people create a culture of like, oh, if you're not doing anything, you're not doing anything for the movement. Mm. Like they make you feel hella bad for going on a vacation (laughs) for a long time. And specifically after my brother was killed, I was living my personal life private. Mm -hmm. And to this day, like, and that's just like my own undoing and my trauma and my experience Mm -hmm. that like I struggle with sharing my joy because a lot of the times people will be like, oh, you don't love the movement or you don't love your brother because you're taking a break from... Mm -hmm from that Mm. and that's crazy to it's just people coming from a place of pain Mm. i'm trying to come from a place of love and a place of joy and a place a place that's rested wow um and so the whole thing of like rest and and also dealing with folks in in community that are like if you're not doing the work then you're not contributing and it's like damn you think we're gonna we're gonna accomplish abolition tomorrow I wish, yeah. but are we really? Yeah. No, we're not. It's okay for me to take a rest. Yeah. It's okay for me to to cancel a meeting right now because I'm I don't have the mental capacity for it, mm. or I just feel very overwhelmed. Like it's okay to do those things, and I think creating a culture where it's okay to not be okay mm. should be fine. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And I think too when you, and if you could share a little bit about you went on a trip to Puerto Rico mm-hmm. as your own sort of like rest as resistance type of thing, mm-hmm. which I'm like, one, I'm glad that you went because knowing the work that you're doing, it's like, it is true. People in movement can feel like, oh, well, if I'm doing all this and I'm basically like working this hard and getting burnt out, basically, then you should too, which is like, damn, that's like colonial ideas right there that we need to not, like, why do we want us all to feel bad? Man, right? that's agents of white supremacy. Like, we do, we do it to each other. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, you're not, you're not grinding as hard as me? Like, oh, you're not doing your job. Like, mm. damn, that's crazy how we, like, project that to folks. And it'd be, we do that to our own people. Yeah, and I, I do think that there's a lot to say in you choosing to, like, 
basically put a stop to this. Like, no, I'm not going to like engage in this behavior. I'm not going to engage in these ways of thinking. And instead, I'm going to purposely do this as like my own sort of like challenging and resistance to what is. And so could you share a little bit about how you went about that or in Puerto Rico, what that looked like for you and how that showed up? Yeah. So I recently took a trip to Puerto Rico for two weeks and Honestly, I didn't do shit. <laughs> and I loved it. I like I turned my vacation responder for my emails. I like turned a lot of the things off. No, I I couldn't I, if you weren't immediate family, if you wasn't like my immediate people, I wasn't going to hit you up and I wasn't going to respond to you until I was back. Mm-hmm. Like just setting boundaries, also being present. Learning to be present and not being on social media. I don't have to post everything that I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Um, also, the notion of like, oh, if you're not posting nothing, you're not doing anything. Mm-hmm. And learning that also is a challenge because you want to showcase your work, mm-hmm. what you're doing. But also, you want to be present and enjoy the things for you, not mm-hmm. for the next person. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, in Puerto Rico, I was very much just in the beach reading a book. And the book that I was reading uh, is actually uh, Grief is Love. I was reading that too. And I oh. finished it. Yeah. Um, if you haven't read that book, y'all, y'all need to read it. But honestly, Can you tell us what the book is? yeah, Love. What's her name? Oh, I don't remember the name. That's so cool you read that. Yeah. Yes. So I was reading Grief is Love during, during my time in Puerto Rico by Marissa Renee. And literally, I was just a lot of, I've had a lot of language and, and tools for, for my own journey of grieving, um, but also learning that my grief is going to change as the years go by, right? My, it, there's no five step rule of of grief. That's not real. Like you can go back and forth to diff- to acceptance to to all these things. But I think for me, reading this book gave me a lot of guidance or just comfort, even of like it's okay to rest. Mm-hmm. It's okay, like you experiencing joy. You're also at the same time, honoring your loved one's legacy. Mm -hmm. You're honoring your loved one's legacy um, while taking care of yourself. And I feel like a lot of the times those were very disjointed for me. Mm -hmm. For me, like my joy, if I was experiencing joy, I wasn't honoring that. Um, And if I wasn't, if I was honoring my brother, then I wasn't like also experiencing joy at the same time. And so those things can exist together at the same time. And so just reading, being on the beach Mm -hmm. and listening to the waves and just reading and, and, Sitting in that silence and just feeding myself this wisdom was super special uh, for me because I don't ever give myself the permission and the time to just sit down and read a book. Yeah, I, I've been now that I've been back, I've been reading another book, um, how trauma is stored in your body. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying to read that at work and I'm trying to read it at home. And it just doesn't hit the same. Yeah. And it's like I'm also learning things about myself that like I need to be away Mm -hmm. I need to be in silence and I need to be alone to like indulge in like reading yeah because I'm oftentimes distracted or people need me to do things um so also learning how to do that yeah no I love that you took the time to go to the beach and read and 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 at the same time it's you're allowing the healing to take place like Mm -hmm. it's not gonna happen right it's not gonna happen at work it's not gonna happen like around others it has to kind of take place with you and yourself and giving yourself the time um, and the space to really think internally and, and to and to think about what is it that I need to feel or need to understand to like really heal right and those things are at the same time while you see it as like you're taking a break you're also still also doing things for movement at the same time mm-hmm. which is like some people don't want to see that or acknowledge that but it's like you healing yourself is moving towards liberation yeah it it is abolition and it's important in helping me improve myself to show up Mm. like i can't show up how i want to show up if i'm not even taking care of my body mind and spirit like if i'm just there physically cool but if i'm not like actively engaging in the way that i want to engage then that means i just need to like take care of myself some more to then do that Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and how do you feel like now knowing that healing as an avenue and it's a constant thing that's going to happen and it's a constant process Mm -hmm. to get there how are you kind of trying to allow that to persist in the the work that you're doing not only like literal work but I mean work in terms of like getting towards a world that allows that to occur that allows us to sit on the beach and read and and, and allow ourselves to be with ourselves how are you making these things kind of happen as you imagine a world that is um, an abolitionist world yeah, I think challenging myself to one rest and just slow down 
um, is super important for me to even get to that. Um, I think a lot of a lot of times I'm constantly in a space where I feel like I have I'm constantly in a space of like there's just so many expectations um, that are needed, not just for me, but like the work that's being done um, and just being associated with like, oh, well, if Ashley's not here, then we shouldn't be doing this. Like also feeling the sense of responsibility of like, oh, if, if I'm not here, it's not going to get done, mm-hmm. where it also translates as like if you have to be here because otherwise things aren't going to get done. Mm. So being challenged with that um, is a whole thing within itself. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't know if I even... No, 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 that's great. No, it really is because it's like it's telling of you yourself as a young person, as someone just like as an activist, really, you shouldn't have to feel like you need to be somewhere to physically like be contributing to the collective effort of what requires collective sort of movement building uh, to move forward. Like it mm-hmm. should never really fall on one person or we should never really sort of suggest that in order to make things happen, we have to like hold others accountable to that. And in good ways, we can hold people accountable, but in ways where we're taking that away from the healing from happening, that's not like the ideal thing to occur uh, for anybody, really. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, with that, I'll kind of just get us into this idea of like, and now as you've car- now as you've understood uh, from the beginning of the inception of you being with educators who allowed you to understand these ideas at a very young age, to your encounter and your family's experience with the police, to your own sort of liberation and healing journey, how have all these experiences? come to like inform the person that you are now as a, an abolitionist that's moving things towards a world that other people may not understand but you understand it and so how how are you trying to make that uh, a reality who yeah and i was like <laughs> basically your whole life a little yeah. wrap around <laughs> yeah a little wrap around service around my whole life and how I, <laughs> in the future um i think for me really is just Every experience, and it's a trip, and I'm sure other people have have this moment of like, oh my God, everything's full circle, because mm-hmm. I've had so many of those moments. Um, it's like you learn something out of each experience, mm-hmm. and I think in a weird ass way, like being radicalized in high school to then meeting people and just connecting with people um, down to my brother's experience and me working with young people now have all came for full circle like di- I've learned different things in different times of my life that I've, I now plug in in different things like I know how to show up when I'm working with young people I know how to show up when I'm out in community um I know how to show up when or I know how to navigate period also um in different scenarios and in different situations and I think my my unique experience uh and my unique lived experience give me a lot of wisdom even at that a lot of times people are like, your lived experience isn't enough. Mm. Like, you need to have um, a degree to validate your experience. And I'm like, also, there's this whole thing of, like, imposter syndrome. Mm. Um, Even though I've had all these experiences, I feel, sometimes I feel like, oh, I'm not deserving. Oh, I'm not worthy. And those are just valid things that we all experience. But it's also, I also challenge myself. While I'm learning a lot of these things, I'm also trying to unlearn a lot of these toxic things of, like, I'm worthy I'm I'm needed. Um, I deserve to be in these spaces. Um, but also that my lived experience is credible and and, and valid. Mm. That I don't need. I I could get a degree. Yeah, you could. And, and I'm you, working you need, towards yeah, that. Yeah. But like I don't need a degree to validate all the shit that I went through. Mm. And I think for me, that also helps me figure out how to show up into spaces. Period. One hundred percent. No, I love that. And I think. The last thing I'll sort of say is that one thing that resonated with me was you shared you didn't pursue at the time because of what was happening with your brother. You didn't end up pursuing going to pursue a degree at the time, but knowing it was something you very much so wanted to do and could do if you Mm -hmm. wanted to. But despite not, like, the education and the understanding and the experiences that you gathered amid that time was perhaps more impactful than getting any degree would have been you know so I think that in itself just like definitely carrying that with you that like you can't get this at school <laughs> like that's the point of this is anything we talk about here you will not learn at school mm-hmm. it is likely that you're gonna learn it in movement or with people who like are willing to to see you as a young person that's like worth 
like sharing their insights and mm-hmm. they're willing to mentor you, which is precisely what kind of happened here. So I think it's just like all together. I, it's a beautiful thing to hear how your life has come to be this thing of helping others move forward um, in ways that allow them to really be themselves, but also like to grow as as young abolitionists, you know. Um, and sort of the last question I'll ask you is. Um, In envisioning what this world can be, knowing now what you know, what does an ideal abolitionist world look like to you? For me, it looks like intersectional movement building. Mm. It looks like a lot of times people want to be like, and this is pride and ego. And sometimes we see that in these in these spaces where it's like, I'm the one that championed blah, blah, blah. I'm the one. (laughs) <laughs> it's very like me, me, me. Yeah. But it's like, okay, cool. If you did that on your own, what would it look like if everybody came together from like different sectors, from policy, from community, from folks in research and academia, all coming together to just dream mm-hmm. what that looks like? You know, a lo- it's not going to, it's not all just on one person mm-hmm. to accomplish. It's going to take everybody. Mm-hmm. So whether it's educating our abuela down the block, what the like, the ideas of abolition, whether it's going into schools to teach our young people, like it's going to take everybody um, to really work towards that. And for me, it looks like credible messaging messaging programs. It looks like we don't need police. It looks like we got our uncles and, and older like homies on the block mentoring our youth. It looks like, you know, violence interruptions. Like it looks like if a, if, a, if a mom is telling you, instead of saying, I'm going to call the cops, I'm going to call our neighbor to come in and, and conflict mediate yeah. um, in, in a more restorative manner. That's what it looks like for me. Um, dreaming beyond the systems that were designed to harm. Um, dreaming beyond, uh, you know, systems that are deeply rooted in, in colonialism, imperialism, yeah. uh, systems of oppression. All those things. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. It sounds like a beautiful world and I would (laughs) love to be a part of it. Um, But yeah, no, let's continue like having these conversations and like it was so great to to have you on and I look forward to building that world with you. Yes. (laughs) In today's episode with Ashley Monterrosa, we learned about the importance of centering young people in movements, embracing mental health and wellness as a way to achieve true liberation embracing rest as resistance, and understanding that police violence is gun violence. Caring for myself is not self-indulgence. It is self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare, says Audre Lorde. This quote emerged in my life when I was in college. I didn't actually hear it before that, but I started to understand it at a time when I was just beginning to engage as an organizer, um, what that meant and the work that that took. Um, and what it really felt to like be part of something that was contributing to change, but not necessarily learning to take care of myself or learning how to nurture myself and how that was critical to me being able to then do the work of being an organizer. Um, what this quote means to me is learning to embrace what it means to preserve ourselves uh, in support of movement, because if we don't preserve and, and sustain um, our own well-being on a day-to-day basis. Uh, we can't achieve the work that, that it takes to do movement. Um, so yeah, that's what that quote means to me. Okay. Yeah, so growing up as a child of immigrants, I often felt like I would feel tired or um, uh, upset or uh, depressed or all these different things that I didn't really understand um, why, you know, then sharing that to like a Latino family wasn't well received. Um, And I started to just have like behaviors around not being productive, right? When I first moved away from home and started living on my own, I remember I would like sometimes wake up really late and miss like the entire morning and feel like what am I doing with my day and my life and why am I being so lazy as it's often defined in Latino culture? Um, I would feel like a, a deep sense of remorse for not being productive and not not only for myself, but being productive in terms of like everything it is that I care about. In this case, in terms of organizing or in terms of movement building, like why am I wasting time sleeping when I could be doing those things? And so I started to understand that if I didn't sleep, I couldn't go do those things. Or if I didn't feel rested, I couldn't show up fully as myself or in a good mood or, or positive. Um, and instead, I started to like have 
hate around it, right? As we often do, doing things that um, can feel mundane or can feel like a, a, a really deep issue that affects our heart and soul. And so if you're not taking the time to embrace that and understand that, that's when I really started to see I need to rest in order to move forward. So now I model rest by giving myself the space to sleep and to relax and to take the time to do things that I enjoy. I do yoga a lot now, which is like, I love it so much because it gives me the space to rest, but also be in like a deep presence with myself um, and to just be like in a quiet room, um, like stretching my body in the ways that it needs to and being able to heal myself in, in that manner. Um, while it's like an untraditional, like, way or thing that I like didn't know um you know it's like a, a dominantly like white idea uh to do yoga I started to move away from that and start to understand like no these are actually ancestral healing ways of, of living life uh that can allow us to really understand ourselves and our bodies um, and just how critical that is to, to living daily life okay Schools Not Prisons podcast is produced by Revolve Impact, an award-winning social change creative agency and content studio in partnership with Mordida Studios. This podcast is produced by myself, Irene Franco Rubio, Akishian Wells, Mariela Rosario, and Mike De La Rocha.